Okay. Um, reason that you hear redundancy is that I want important stuff to get repeated. So at the beginning, we'll do kind of overlap of what we have done last time, like the end of the last session, and then we go to the next one. Pointer types, no extra credit. Um, when you're dealing with pointers, pointers uh, are simply types, and uh, they are not um, any specific type of an uh, entity that they do anything special. When we are dealing with pointers, <clears throat> when we are dealing with pointers, anything that we actually specify as a pointer, it doesn't matter what it is, we put an asterisk beside it, we call that a pointer. So that R is a pointer of type integer. Integer, pointer, type. Asterisk belongs to type. Together they are one type called pointer. If I have different types of pointer, if I have an employee pointer, assuming that employee is a defined thing, employee pointer, pointer E, the pointer E over here as an employee is again a pointer. The size that E and R are allocating in memory are the same. They're both four bytes, no difference. As, as I mentioned before, it doesn't matter where you are sending your letter, the envelope and the address size is always similar. Huge apartment building or a small house, size of the address is the same. Therefore, the address is the same. Um, we talked about type defs. We said that, uh, we talked about type defs, right? Okay, we talked about type defs. And we said that type defs are not like defined statements. They are actually different when we are dealing with them. Um, which means if you actually, uh, first of all, type def was to essentially give a new name to already existing type. It's like reference that you do for a variable. Type def does that to a type. So if I have, as we mentioned, something like, uh, this, a type def unsigned integer, we call it u integer pointer, unsigned integer pointer, um, that becomes a new name for this type of thing. Therefore, if I actually create something like this, what is A and what is B and what is C? Yeah, A is a pointer, B and C are just integer variables, right? But if I actually use that pointer type, then because it actually covers the type, now are all pointers. E and F, e and F, J, uh, F and uh, G are all pointers. Absolutely no difference. I'll be okay with this? You're okay? All right. We talked about void pointers. Void pointers are essentially pointers with no type, which means they can be casted and used if, as any type of type. Uh, I said cast. Dynamic cast, static cast, reinterpret, and uh, const cast. We know about these. OK. OK, so um, I call these templated casts, uh, the casts that they came when C++ was reinforced with new standards to become a strongly typed language. So what happens is that we had implicit cast that we did all the time. We simply wrote something and cast it. You know, remember what the casts were, right? Cast and um, let me actually bring something that may be going to help us. For an example, let me see what do I have here. Okay, say I have a class called name. Are we okay with this? So I have a class called name, as you see. So this class of mine, uh, has uh, a value that is supposed to be the name value that we are getting. We uh, initialize that value to a null pointer, just telling you what, what it does. And 
uh, just having it constructed that creates a dynamic name. So that's the size of the name. This is the, the SDR copy. It co uh, uh, this is the SDR length. It gets the length of the, finds the length of the, uh, the um, uh, uh, string in value. Uh, then I allocate to the, to the size. And finally, this is a string copy. I copy everything into the, uh, into it and it's done. I just didn't want to use the string copy stuff, so that's the code. And this is uh, third semester C++, so I'm allowed to do stuff like this. If you don't understand what it is, go hack the code and try to find out what it is. Um, just quickly, when I write over here while loop and while loop I, uh, first of all, oh, let me just do this. Look at the code. Anybody have any problem with it? Like, if it's unclear, I explain. I want you to first uh, read these three lines and see what is that explanation in front of it. Okay, I'm just looking at the faces to see if it's like something that you say, what the heck, or... Okay, quickly going through it. Um, Null terminated string ends with a null, right? Um, I, want to be, I want you to be frank about this, and I'm just asking to know what I'm dealing with. How many of you understood what the code is doing? Okay. So uh, I don't want to use string header file. So I did the things myself, okay? So what happens is that what is length of a string? You have to count the characters until you hit the null, correct? So what did I do in here? I wrote a while loop. When I put a semicolon, the while loop doesn't have a body, right? When it doesn't have a body, it keeps looping in itself until value size becomes zero, correct? And zero, size is zero at the beginning. So it says value zero. If it's not null, it wants to loop. There is no body. It simply repeats the condition, which means size will be added by one. And it keeps doing that until it reaches to the point that it reaches to the null byte. When it reaches to the null byte, it stops. But because plus plus happens after, it's going to add one extra. Therefore, it's going to be SDRLM plus one. It's going to be one more than what it's supposed to be. All right? Then I want to actually allocate memory for that string. It's good that it's plus one because I want one extra for the null byte, right? So I'm going to allocate the size that I want in here, put it in a value, and then reduce the size by one so I have the exact size. Are we okay with that? Then I write a for loop, and I'm going to say for m size, uh, m value size is equal to size. So I'll literally go backwards because now size is standing at the end, right? So what I need to do, I need to start copying from the end and come to the beginning. Size is SDR length. That's the, uh, the, the size of each string is the index of the null byte, correct? First, I'm copying the null byte, then I'm going backwards to the beginning of the string. Just copy everything backwards. Instead of that direction, I did, did it reverse, right? Just didn't want to do so. That's kind of a cryptic thing, but you see stuff like this all the time. So it's a good thing to take a look at it. And you go through from here to here, everything's going to go clear about point, the strings and all, all the little things that we need to know about loops and things like that. So anyway, this is a name. So it actually allocates the name. A constructor and put that one over there so it's a dynamic name. But anyways, what I wanted to say is that talking about casting, so we have regular cast from old times. I just wanted to an example of a class, so let's do it like this. I have a class name with a constructor and um, a print statement and a name. So um, with casting that we dealt before, we could do casting in different ways. I could cast, uh, like I could say integer a, um, and then set, and, and I have a, a double B, and I had A is set to uh, integer B, an implicit type of cast, right? It just uh, temporarily converts that one to this one. Of course, it's going to be, uh, it's possible that you're going to lose that over there. We know all those things. So this is a cast that we had from, from before. But these, these casts are coming from C language. Don't be fooled by the Parentheses go at the other side. It's nothing but a, but a C cast. So in C language, we did the casting like this. Now in C++, we are, we are doing, so this, this is the C version of it. 
and that's the C++ version of it, the other one. This is the C version of it, and the C++ version of it actually puts it around uh, the name of the variable, which is fine. Okay, so that's the casting. We had another type of casting was not actually casting. It was, a co it was creation of a, uh, of a temporary nameless object. We did that, right? So we had, we had something like we created an employee, A and, no, sorry, sorry, name, A, and I set that name to um, a casted ABC. So if you had something like this, of course, this is going to cause, uh, sorry, this is going to cause memory leak, but just so we know. So I could have name X, then I could have X is set to name ABC. So essentially, like this one that is being casted, it is going to cast this constant character pointer to a name. So we know that that's not actually casting. It creates a temporary nameless object, and then it does a blind copy over there. And because that's dynamic, it doesn't have copy constructor or assignment operator. I'm going to have memory leak. But anyways, that shows that casting in that manner is not safe and, and we can't, it can't be done. Um, of course, to make this thing work, I have to have a copy constructor, an assignment operator, and things that are going to work good after that. But forgetting about these, what type of casting? These are the castings that we learned from previous semester. The castings that we have right now, um, these casts are uh, uh, kind of templated casts, which means uh, you can do. Um, Casts uh, like this, for example, you can, uh, the, the syntax for it is this. So you have some type, uh, and then, uh, and you have type B, and then you have A, uh, and you can write over here dynamic cast. Then you, um, let's put over here type A and type B. Sorry, you put B over here. These are templated casts. So you, you say, I want dynamic cast of this type. So it's essentially casts A to a B and puts it in B. OK? So that's the syntax for it. But let's see what it actually does. A dynamic cast for any, uh, oh, these are, let's add one more thing. By doing this, you're actually asking the compiler to make sure and guarantee that the casts are done properly, otherwise it throws an exception for you. We're going to learn later on what exception handling is, but when we come to it, it throws an exception so you know that the cast wasn't successful. It's not a blind cast, it's a cast that actually you can uh, uh, ask compiler to, to check it for you. It is only to be used with pointer or references to classes. OK, so dynamic cast is to cast classes. It's not for primitive values. What it does, it guarantees that uh, uh, the cast that actually happening, so if the cast that is actually being done, it is, there is actually an object that can be casted. For example, I have a, a bicycle and I have a motorcycle. If I want to cast a uh, motorcycle to a bicycle. Can I do that? It's a downcast. You can do that because a, bi uh, a motorcycle is actually a bicycle. It's child of it. So all the properties of a bicycle is in a motorcycle. When you downcast it, the cast works. It can do upcast between objects, which means you can cast a bicycle up to a motorcycle. Of course, if you have just a bicycle and the object is not actually a pointer to a motorcycle, it's going to fail. But if you have a pointer of a base pointing to a derived class, and you upcast that one, you can actually upcast a pointer to its derived classes. And that's what dynamic casts are used for. So only when it's polymorphic. So it's, it's done for polymorphic objects and make sure that everything's uh, uh, 
a downcast for polymorphics. And these polymorph when I say polymorphics objects, essentially objects that have virtual functions and the virtuality wants to take over and so on and so forth. You know that from OOP244. Then we have static cast. We're going to go through this in detail. It's just for you to know when you see somewhere, you, you know what does it mean. This happens between related types. You cannot just cast anything to anything with that one. The dynamic cast was done uh, in hierarchy, in inheritance, polymorphic objects. That's what it's for. Static cast is essentially a safe type of old type of cast that we have. It has to be between related stu stuff. You cannot cast a, a, an employee to a car. It doesn't make sense. You cannot do a cast. It's going to throw an exception. It does casts that are possible. You can cast a double to an int into a double, character to an integer. Things like that can be done. Related objects, they can be casted with static cast. Then we have reinterpret cast. Now, reinterpret cast. Oh, the, the static cast, you're responsible actually for it to make sure that it's possible to be done as a programmer, okay? For reinterpret, reinterpret cast, it goes wild. You can cast anything to anything. Okay, so if you really want to shoot yourself in a foot, that's what you want, okay? It gives you the power to cast anything to anything. Of course, based on the logic that you have, then you can actually... Uh, uh, use it if needed. I cannot tell you the, the utilities for it and the, 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 the use case for it, but when the time comes, you'll know. The other one is const cast. Const cast, again, it's C++, all those things that you do to ensure safety of your code, they can all be overwritten. Const cast is to remove the constant. So if you have constant character pointer, you, can, you cannot pass it to a regular pointer because it's, the constant is going to be removed and you get a warning from the, from the compiler, right? That this is a constant, you cannot use a constant value with a, you cannot make a constant non-constant, right? With this you can. You can actually cast a constant character pointer to a regular pointer and then modify it. Okay? That's that one. And again, if something goes wrong, then you're going to get it. And then we have something called type ID with all these things, these casts. Another tool comes into play called type ID. Yes. Mm -hmm. At the target, it is. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. No, 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 no. The, the handle. See, when you are doing a cast, so <clears throat> A remains constant, but B becomes a, uh, so if I actually do this, say, say I do this, okay? <clears throat> so if A was of a type, something like this, uh, Let's actually put, put them both at the same time. So I'm going to put over here const type a pointer a, okay? And in here you say, all right? So b now is a non-constant pointer of type a. Is that correct? Now, when you actually say B is const cast type A pointer A, it removes that const out of A and puts it in B. B, A is still const. You cannot use A to access that. But if you use B, you are essentially overwriting the constant values A was pointing to. Okay? The old one remains const. But you have a handle to the location the old one could not modify. Okay? Crazy stuff, I know, but when the time comes, you'll know what, what is it used for. And also, we have type ID. 
Okay? Type ID is something that extracts the type of the things you're dealing with. So with all this power, sometimes the program gets so complicated, you don't know what the types of the things that you're working with. You want to make sure if you're actually, you want to make sure that, like for example, you are casting a bicycle to a motorcycle, you want to make sure it is a bicycle. If you want to do that, how, how are you going to do it? If that, especially when it comes to the point that you have templates and you have hierarchy stu of stuff and you have a, a, a pointer that you're not sure what the type is, you can simply, using type ID, I say type ID of int, that's going to return actually int. Okay? So you can actually compare the type ID of an object and see, so if I do something like this, That's going to return int. So you can identify what is the type of a thing that you have no idea what it is. OK, it tells you what the type is, and then you know it's safe to, ca to do the cast, or you have to go through other channels. Yes? That's, that returns int. No, that's it. So, so you say it, it actually returns a constant character pointer that is an int. Are we okay? All right. Uh, that's kind of a quick, rev quick uh, explanation of uh, what uh, 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 constant cast is, and then uh, that brings this one up. Void pointers. Oh, what is this? Void pointers, they can point to anything, OK? So if you want to uh, access, uh, you want, if, uh, I, I think I explained this last time. Uh, did I? Did I talk about this last time? No? OK. So what a void pointer is. Void pointer essentially is uh, a pointer that doesn't know what the target is. Therefore, all arithmetic stuff that you could do with pointers you cannot do with void. OOP244, remember arithmetic stuff with pointers? If you have integer pointer p, p++ adds how much to the p? Oops. The size of time, right? OK. OK. Um, a pointer arithmetic essentially means 1 for for a, for a pointer number one to be added to a pointer essentially means the size of that pointer will be added. So if, if I have a double pointer p, I go p is equal to p plus one, eight will be added to it because double size is an eight. Pointer's job is to point to a target, correct? If the target of my hand is table, if I say one, it's going to go to next table. So the size should be size of a table. But if I target of my hand is a student, it won't go to the next table. It goes to the next student. So the pointers, that's why the pointers know what their types are. So when they are pointing to the target, when you add to their address, they know where the next object is sitting. Am I making sense? OK? So that's pointer arithmetic. Essentially, you deal with pointers. And that, that's the reason that. Uh, anything that you are dealing with, uh, uh, the pointers that we are dealing with, the syntax is made that you add an asterisk to the type, and together it means pointer because it needs to know what the target is. Now, if you don't know what the target is, if, or if you want to break the target into pieces and do something with it, and you want the raw address, the raw address is called void pointer. Void by itself is non-existent. You cannot say void A. You cannot create an instance of nothing. You follow? But you can have address of nothing, ironically, which means it means it's not nothing, it means anything. When you say void pointer p, essentially you are creating a, an, an, a pointer which doesn't know what the address is. It really, all it does, it keeps the address of a destination and you have no idea what it is. A good example for it is memory dumps or memory copy and things like that. When you have a piece of memory and you want to copy that piece of memory to somewhere else, what do you do? 
You don't know what the target is. You don't know how. It, so all you need to do is to pass the address to a void pointer, then break it down to characters and do the copying. And that's the example for it. I have an integer and I have a double, and I want to do a raw copy from one double to another double. If, and I want to do a raw copy from an integer to another integer. If I wanted to actually write a code to do it individually, then I had to create different types of functions and overload it and have uh, mem copy between integers, mem copy between doubles, mem copy between employees. But if I want to just copy pieces of memory, the easiest way is to create a pointer of any type, which means a void pointer. Then, so as you see, I have a void pointer destination, constant void pointer source, and I'm going to say unsigned integer size. So I'm getting the size for it. This could have been size t. You know that, right? Right? OK. Whoops. All right. Then what I will do, I will cast the void pointer that I have to a to the smallest addressable unit of memory, which is a character, correct? So I have the size. And for this, I'm doing static cast to tell to the compiler, hey, don't worry. I know what I'm doing. I am casting this memory that is coming in of type void. If you do it the other way, there's no problem. You can put any address in void. Because any address is address of anything, right? <laughs> But you, when you want to cast the, the void pointer back to something else, then you have to actually tell to the compiler. OK, so I'm actually getting the, uh, I am casting the destination to a regular character pointer, and I'm casting the source to a constant character pointer. Now that I have character pointers, I can do pointer arithmetic. I can traverse through the memory. So I'm going to start from the beginning, go up to size, and copy one by one everything from C, character source, to the character destination, and copy everything blindly up to that size. So when I'm calling copy mem, the B and A over here are integers. I can simply say copy mem into the address of B from address of A to the size of A. It passes the integer address to that one. It doesn't care that it's an integer. What is important that the size is 4. So it's going to pass 4 over there. It's going to cast the pointer, uh, void pointers to the, uh, to, uh, back to characters. Going one by one essentially treats the integer as an array of four characters. Then for the next one, I'm saying copy mem to the address of D from address of C, size of C. C is a double. So essentially, it passes it up. It has the address of destination in the source, and size is 8, and it's going to copy everything byte by byte, and that becomes the, yes. Mm -hmm. That you are pointing to a character, right? Yes. The pointer is pointing to a character. And then you're using for double. So how a pointer points to a character that is Pointing double. to a double? Ah, good, good question. Now, I want you to set aside your IPC and 244 personality, IP2 OP244 personality, and look to memory as what it is. Can you tell me where a double sits in memory? In RAM, right? It sits in RAM. When it sits in a memory, the memory that the double is sitting, is it any different with the memory that an integer is sitting in? Is it any different with the memory that character is sitting in? No, no, no. Question is this. Is it no difference? So if I have an array of eight characters and one double from computer's point of view, does it care which one is which? That's exactly what I'm doing. So I'm saying you gave me eight bytes. I do not care. Maybe it's an array of two integers that you want to copy. I don't care. I just know that you have this much memory, and I want to just copy it. I don't care what is the size. So like you want, if you want to, for example, know how the information is spread around doubles, you can do that. And then convert it to bits, and that's what we're going to learn at the end of the semester, but not now. So anyway, so that's, that's what it is. So this is essentially void pointers. Yes? Yeah, exactly, one byte at a time. 
has the size of the variable the same. So yeah. for instance, in each here you see this character. Yes. This character is here. I don't copy it. I cast the address. Okay. C des and des are identical. They are both. They both contain the same address in it. One doesn't have any type. Therefore, the compiler doesn't know what is sitting at the address. That is des. C des is forced to have a character pointer, which means when you can now say target of. Okay. What I'm saying is that in here. If I do this, target of destination, it gives me an error. If I write target of destination, it gives me an error. What does it say? Expression must be a pointer to a complete object type. Destination is not complete. This by itself is void, which means I don't know what's at the target. I take that raw address and put it in a character pointer. When I put it in a character pointer, then I fake it for the compiler. Compiler doesn't know there's a double over there. I fake it, lie to the compiler. I'm going to say it's not a double, it's eight characters. Now copy it byte by byte. So it breaks that thing into its pieces and copies it piece by piece. And it passes it over. Are we OK? Yes, of course we can. That's so when the target of C des is double. It's not double. Target of C des is a character. Okay, I have to. But you, but we are passing double. Yes, give me two seconds. Sadly, this part is not going to be recorded because I'm drawing on a screen. Soon I'm going to have a touchpad screen, and then when it comes, then I, I actually draw on a screen so you can see. But this is not going to get recorded. So. So what happens is this, OK? This is the memory. All those people who are listening on YouTube, use your imagination, OK? So this is the memory, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, 1, 2, 1, 2 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Correct? Right? Are we okay with that? Okay. Now I'm going to do this. Character pointer P. So it's going to have some place called P as a character pointer. Are we okay with this? Okay. Now I'm going to do this. P is set to static cast of address of D. What's going to happen? This is the address of D, correct? That address of D is going to go to P. So P is going to point to the beginning of the double, correct? If I say D is equal to 1.2345, it's going to write the whole thing over it to put 1.2345 over there, correct? Right? Are we OK? That's, that's, that's just IPC 144. If I say target of P is equal character A, it's just going to put an A in here. It doesn't know that the target is a double. It just overwrites the first byte of the double with that A. What happens to that odd, odd value? It turns to garbage because you just overwrote one byte of it. So you're essentially looking at the same piece of memory in two different ways. Capisce? Are we good? Are we OK? Yes, sir. No, it's not going to be memory leak. It's going to be crazy stuff happening. It's just your, your 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 will be gone. Jeff, yeah, it's your memory. It's like you have a cup of coffee and you put soup in it. What's going to happen? Nothing. You still have a cup full of liquid, but it's not coffee. It's soup. 
That's all. Are we okay? Or a bowl of soup to put coffee in it. <laughs> I don't know. That makes more sense. Are we good? All right. Anybody knows how to wipe the board? Oh, thank you. <laughs> see, thank you. <laughs> I didn't see that. It was behind the screen. We okay down to here? Are we okay one? Yes. <laughs> you know you can't get over this void thing, do you? Yes, sir. Yeah. Can we use family to do the same thing? No. no. You can use union to do the same thing, but we're going to learn later on what it is. Templates. I don't even know what you mean by that. I mean, templates. No, wait, wait, wait. T templates. This is C language. It runs in, it's not C. It, not the, sorry, that's static cast. It's not there anymore, but static cast is not in C. But in C, you could have done this with a regular cast. You, now you get 55,000 warnings, but, but still, you can do it. Okay, that comes from C. Templates are essentially blueprint of logics so the compiler can write it for you for different types. I don't know how to relate the two. So, I mean, you don't know the, uh, the size of the type, right? So, I mean, the template, you know the size of the type. The type. So, you copy the memory, it depends on the size of the type. Oh, oh, so yeah, you're actually saying, oh, so, oh, so you're saying, I, I see where you're coming from, but no, the, it is not for, templates are not for this. Okay. Of course, you can, use, but yeah, it's not. Yeah, I know where you're coming I now. Yeah. No. <laughs> the, answer, the answer is no. Okay. Are we good down to here? Are we good one? Are we good two? Are we Okay. You used to have a question? Well, why is, isn't it double sitting yet? Yes, it's double, and we are looking at it as, as eight characters. OK, are we good? All right. OK. Uh, all right. Um, and no questions? OK, remember I told you I'm going to give you five minutes break very soon. It's very, very quick, uh, very early. That's the one. Five minutes break. I'm going to pause. Um, uh, again, that, that, the video, that these videos that I'm recording and stuff, don't rely on it. Like, I just heard somebody told me that the other video, half of it doesn't have audio. Okay, so, <laughs> so my apologies. I, I'll try. I'm trying to, 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 to do the recordings, but sometimes it goes bad. So don't rely on it. If, it, if it's there, good. If it's not, I don't know what to do because <laughs> I don't have any other copy. That's what it is. It's, that's, that's what's happening. So, references. Uh, references, uh, essentially, we are, we, are, we are talking about, when, when we talked about references, uh, do you remember what a reference was? A reference was essentially an alias for an already existing thing, right? So, references that you had, these references could, uh, Replace already existing objects, and therefore you can do whatever you want. Now, in C++ 17, we have two different types of reference. We have L, uh, L value reference and R value reference. L value reference is essentially a, a reference that sits at the left side of an assignment operator, which means um, uh, it, it is um, um, L, um, L value is a reference that is accessible currently to you. And you can access it, and it's there, and uh, you can use it like a regular thing. Like you say, integer reference A is equal to B. And B is an integer, A becomes a reference. You can use it as that one, and everything's good. Okay. And we have another type of reference that is uh, uh, R value. The R value reference is essentially so the thing that you have at right side of the assignment operator. 
um, an R value essentially is a temporary object, an object that will die soon, nameless object, orphan object, the object that is going to go away soon. These type of objects reference uh, can be recognized by C++. And therefore, C++ uh, has a specific sign for it. Now, I'm going to write you a piece of code on this, on this name thing, and you'll see exactly what I mean. OK? So as you see, I have over here a print statement, right? You see that? And if I want to overload the O stream from IPC144, we know that I can actually add a function like this. And now what I have over here? I have over here O stream operator, and it receives the name, and it prints the name, but it prints an L value right beforehand. Are we okay? Right? Very simple. The new representation that we deal with in C++ 17 is this guy. I am repeating the exact same thing, but look at the difference. OK? That is a temporary object. The applications are going to come next, but I'll tell you what is it for. OK? Our values are, um, are used to, to recognize pieces of or things that are not needed after, it's, uh, after you, you're done with it. Hmm. Let's say you want to, let's say you want, you have two classes. We have a class, the class is huge, and it has a copy constructor. And you want to copy this class into another class. So it has, it has a copy constructor, it has resources in it, it has dynamic memory allocation, it has thousands of bytes outside of its scope allocated dynamically. Okay? Now you want to copy this into another object and continue working with it in the copy for whatever reason. But when this happens, you don't need the old one anymore. If that's the scenario, what can you do? Like just imagine, that's thousands and thousands of bytes. You just copied it dynamically into the other one using your copy constructor or assignment operator. So it reallocated the memory and puts everything, copied everything from here to there, and, and all good, these good things happen, right? So you essentially allocate new memory, copy all the stuff. You have two copies of the same thing, right? But wait a minute. If it's dynamic memory allocation and you're sure, yet yeah, you don't need the other one anymore, couldn't you just claim ownership of its properties? Kind of the thing that caused the thing that caused uh, uh, failure at the end of your programs when you forgot to have a copy constructor. When you don't have a copy constructor, what happens? And you have yeah, a classes with resources out of its territory. Two classes point to the same place, right? So what happens is that the destructor of the first one is called the memory gets deallocated. When the destructor of the second one is called, the it crashes because it wants to delete something that is already deleted. What if I could detect and say, I do not want to copy. I want to move this stuff from here to here. So I simply claimed ownership of the, of the memories and all the things that the other one has dynamically and remotely made all the pointers and things that that guy had to know. So it doesn't crash at the end. Wouldn't that be nice? You know how quick my programs are going to be? Like if you have dynamic, like if you actually have classes with resources that, you know, when, why do we have classes with resources? Because the, your class becomes a controller. All the data that it has, files that are opened, network connections that are made, all the things that are outside of your classes are essentially resources that classes can use outside, right? And copying, duplicating those things are very difficult. Sometimes you don't have enough resource. You only have five ports to open. You want to claim the port and throw the other garbage away. Sometimes copying is not an option. But at the same time, you don't want to end up having two classes with the same resources. That's 
where this reference comes to play. You actually can recognize what is temporary and you can claim ownership of whatever it has and set everything to that thing to blank so it doesn't, uh, so it doesn't do a crash at the end. That's how it detects it. I'm not going to show you that one yet. I'm just going to show you how it detects, okay? So, essentially, if I have something like this, now take a look at my main. Okay, so that's my, so I have a, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details of that one. So I have a name that has a print and a destructor, right? And I have all, the, and I have all the good stuff in here. Now I'm going to start. So I'm going to, I'm going to start uh, running it. Three years later when it runs, compiles. Okay, let's stick it to the left and stick to the one to the right and move it to, there you go. Oh, oh, this one's on the right. So it comes over here. The name is Fred that's created. So when so I have these two right now. Which one is gonna go to? Is A something temporary? When C out is called and it wants to go over there, will A be gone? No, it's there. It has a reference outside. So it's not a temporary thing. Here moving cannot be done. Well, I, it should not be done because A is needed out there. If that's the case, then it's going to go to that one, and as you see, it's actually an L value, and it prints Fred. Are we okay with this? Right. Now, take a look at this one. How about this one? It's a nameless object. It's doomed to be dead after C out is called, correct? Its existence is not necessary in the other scope, right? So now if I run this beautiful program of mine, the first one, we know which one's going to happen, but the second one is going to go actually build the temporary nameless object. And then go to the one with the R value reference. So essentially, it identifies that this thing is nameless. And N becomes a new name for something that is not out there. It assumes its identity. Are we okay with this? And it prints it out. Returns the OS, and as you see, the destructor is called, and it's dead. Then it comes back to return statement. Are we okay with this? So that's essentially the difference between LVAL and RVAL, okay? And how it understands which one is what. We okay with this? All right. Now. I'm going to give you all the sources for this, so don't worry if I'm uh, rewriting these. I have the sources over there. I have, a, I have my cheat sheet prepared over here, and I'm just copying stuff from there one by one. Okay, and I'm going to give you those, so don't worry about it. Okay? All right? So, so the, all the sources are going to be on, the, on GitHub. Now, If the intention, and, and, and what I'm, what, what did I do? There you go. Wait, where did that start? There you go. Okay, so now let's see what's going to happen. You see that? I said, move A. Okay? I said, move A. So what happens over here? So now if I run this program, I 
I actually sent it over there. So I can tell to compiler, I fake it, and I say, OK, this is going to be moved. Now, if, if I have implemented the move that I told you right now, like if I want to reuse, if I want to, if I want to recycle the sources of a class and make that class empty, this move will invoke that if I have implemented it. I don't know how to implement it now. But when I learn how to implement it, this explicitly says do it. OK? So you can actually say, or you can do ref. It's the exact opposite, which means I want the reference for it, not the move. So it's not going to be, it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a move. It's going to be the reference for it. I want the reference of this thing to be passed, not the move reference, not the, I want the L value to be passed, not R value. So you, it's the same thing, exact same thing, you go STD ref, okay? Uh, later on, you'll see where this is, be, this is going to be used. When you explicitly want to tell the compiler that I want the move action to happen, which means reusing the, the sources of a class instead of copying it, moving, taking ownership of resources of a class instead of copying it, you can use this. Or you tell explicitly, I do not want to reuse the resources and take ownership no matter what I want to get it to get copied. You can do that too. So it's not only copy constructor and assignment operator. You have move constructor and move assignment operator. And using move and ref, you can enforce the compiler to invoke the one that you like. All right? You will not, please, after you see this, write the code of your own. OK? Try to see how it works. It's pretty simple. Um, anyways, OK, so. That's that. Um, there are some new syntax that we need to learn about the language, too. Things that we have done before, there are new syntaxes that you can actually use in uh, uh, um, in uh, C++ to initialize values. If you see over here, for example, one of the things that you need to, 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 to know, you see over here I'm saying null pointer could have had it here. Like Java, in C++ you can actually now initialize the members here instead of here. And that's actually slightly more efficient than have it. In OOP244, those were who were my students. Remember, oh, control Z. Remember what I used to call this blue area? Initialization area. Remember what I told you? Like that's the initialization area. That's where you initialize all the member variables. Remember that? Now you can actually initialize it right in front of it. You can actually say, I want this M value to be null pointer when the object gets initialized. So what happens is that when it actually creates the object, when the object is forming in memory, those attributes inside the, the class will have, initialized, init, will have initial values as it's getting created. It doesn't go through creation and the, step, the, the next step initialization. It will have the initial values inside as it creates it. So I can now do this. And it, and it works the same way. OK? That's one thing. Another thing is this. This is right out of the notes. Okay. 
Line number six is how you initialize in C and C++, right? In OP244. Now you can just, that, that, that assignment is, is redundant now. You don't need it. You can simply put curly brackets right in front of it. And it means initialize. You can even do that. Now this is talking about arrays. I'm saying constant in six over there. I could do this actually. You can do that. So that's a universal, universal syntax for initialization. You put the values in curly bracket in front of it. If it's 1, it's 1. If it's 10, it's 10. You just put it in front of it. Now, line number 8, you know that from C language. When C has five elements and I initialize three of them, what are the rest? The rest are 0. If you want to set everything to zero, just put empty, put empty, empty curly bracket in front of it. It's going to be all zero. OK? When you are dynamically allocating memory and you want to have values initialized as you are doing dynamic memory allocation, that's the syntax for it. You can actually do the dynamic memory allocation and initialize it. We used to not be able to do that. We had to loop through it and set it one by one. Remember that? Or we had to have some kind of a constructor, a default constructor, if it was an object. This all apply to uh, compound types too. It's not only for primitive values. Like if int over here was an employee, and employee had a constructor that accepts an integer as employee number, this would actually initialize it through three different three student uh, employee numbers one, two, and three. OK, so it works exactly the same way with, with uh, good old stuff, too. It doesn't make any difference. Backwards compatible, let's call it, right? Um, and that's it. Questions about this? Suggestions? Objections? <laughs> You're OK? All right, these are just new syntax. Go through it in, a, in the notes. They're all there. Uh, oh, range-based for loops. All those JavaScript lovers. Now, if you want to traverse through a through a class, through a through any type of uh, uh, collection. If you want to traverse through any type of collection, when I say collection, I mean you know collections and arrays, and we're going to come soon to vectors and things like that. All those things, you can traverse through them with a range-based for loop, which essentially means you're going to create a for loop, then you're going to create a reference at the beginning of it, column, put the name of the collection in front of it. OK? It automatically sets that, so in every uh, Repetition of the loop, it's going to set that reference to an element of the loop and go to next one by one. So essentially, this is going to print 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Did I? Does it make sense? So what happens essentially says this. It does this. It says R will be set to A0. Then R will be set to A1, R will be, and it's going to go right to the end of the collection and stop. Right to the end of the set, whatever that set is. We're going to see uh, there are so many different types of sets that will be able All templates for your information if, that you like templates. All right? So that's another thing, range-based loops. Any questions down to here? Yes. You write a regular for loop. <laughs> Anyways, but that's one of the things. Like lots of people, when they actually see these things, they are thinking like, like we throw away the old, every, every single thing that you did in legacy C programming, they all work. All right? <laughs> all right. Uh,
Any other question? And even. Yeah, well, but you don't need to know the type. You can just write auto. That doesn't mean automobile. Did I, I told you what auto is, right? Yeah, it simply assumes the type of what it's, what is it facing, because it's facing elements of the of that array. Whatever the, that actually, rarely you see range loops with real thing, because usually, sometimes when it comes to collections, you don't know what the elements of those collections are, and how it's referred to. If that's the case, auto is your friend. You just that's why we have auto. That's why I always say in OP two four four, please do not use auto because you don't know what is it for. In, in, C, in, IP, in OP345, we really need this because sometimes when there's a collection, you don't know what is the iteration between, like, what does the iteration through the, through the collection. And because you don't know what is the type of that iterator, we call it, then you write auto aerobatically. It assumes the, the, uh, the type that it needs. Are we good? Are we okay? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? All right, all right, all right. Class ends at 3.15, correct, or 10? 15, good, we have, woo, we have, uh, like, 22 minutes, and that's beautiful. Ah, uh, okay. Let me just bring that thing in and, and explain it over here because there are no coding involved. These are just stating the obvious. I'm just going to bring it over here so you know what I'm talking about. So this is kind of, you say, duh, of course. Um, sometimes <clears throat> you need to be able to uh, uh, refer to objects of the same type, like, for example, when you're writing a linked list. Every node, every like you're writing a, a, a dynamic array, every element of the array needs to know where the next element is. So you need to have a pointer of this class to the next class of the same type. That's perfectly OK, all right? But of course, you cannot instantiate an object inside itself. It doesn't make sense. Like, what? That, that's, that's a recursion, right? Recursion of instantiation. That just doesn't make sense, right? You cannot do that. So <clears throat> forward declarations. I think we have done that in OP244, right? Forward declaration. I think I, I created something that forward declarations are, are very much used when there is ownership involved. <coughs> when you have two classes, OK, and one class is completely owner of the other class. Again, the example is a collection, an array. If you have an array, if you have a class called array, that class array has instances of another class called element in it, right? So essentially, one class array has series of elements inside of it, correct? Have you ever seen an element without an array? It doesn't make sense. This is an element. Element of what? It has to be in an array, right? When I say element, I need an array. That's what it is. An element cannot exist without an array. These type of classes are usually fully private. Like classes like element are fully, like the, the element class if I want to create is fully private because no one else is supposed to create an instance of it or know where it's supposed to get created other than inside an array, right? That's what ownership means. And that's where we talked about friendship. Remember about my students? Remember I said friends are what, what are the friends good for? Knife in the back. Remember what I told you? Yeah. So friends are like that. You don't use friends. Friends are never used in object orientation unless ownership is involved. Remember that? I said dog is your friend. No, it's not. You can put it down anytime you want. 
Okay? It's like that. So friends are essentially ownership. That's where everything comes to picture. It, to, to, it becomes clear. So you, when you have an element inside an array, then array becomes a friend of element. And your element becomes a fully private object. Right? Now, listen to this. An element needs to know which array it belongs to. An array needs to know what is an element so it can create one. So which class are you going to write first? If you implement the element first, then how can you refer to any array in there? Because array is element implemented after, right? Shoot. So I'm going to implement array first. When you implement an array, you want to create an element in there. Shoot. The element is coming after, right? That's where forward declaration comes in picture. Now, forward declarations, I call them prototypes of classes. But they are not really prototypes. Why? Because prototypes of functions exactly tell you the message or all the things you need to know to call that function. When you, when you have a prototype of a function, it tells you this is the name of the function, this is what it returns, and these are the arguments it receives. You have all the information needed to call that function. That is why when you write a prototype for a function, your, 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 your program is fully compilable. It compiles as if the function is there. The linker actually checks to see if the promises you made, you actually kept it. Actually, you mentioned the prototype up there. The function is actually somewhere to be found, right? With classes, that's impossible. If I forward declare the class array, how does it know what, pro what properties it has? How does it know what elements its constructor needs? How does it know it's deleted? How does it know what is it? It just knows it's a class. That's why when you forward declare a class, you're only allowed to create pointers or references to it. You cannot actually instantiate them. So when you are doing that array and element, because you want to refer friendship, and friendship doesn't need, if you want to say, this guy is my friend, nobody needs to know who's this guy. They don't need to know how it works. They just need to know he's my friend. I can ask him for favors. Right? That's the same thing. So because of that fact that you have to actually write inside an element that array is your friend so you can manipulate it. For that, you do a forward declaration for the class array. Therefore, the compiler knows it's a class, and that's it, and nothing else. So for friendship, you can use forward declaration. For creating pointers, you can do forward declaration. If you have a reference, can you do forward declaration for reference? I don't remember. Anyways, well, that's it. So at any time that you see instantiation is needed, you cannot use forward declaration. So, oh, that was the forward declaration I was talking about. Another thing, this is, comes from this comes from C. So when you want to instantiate a class, you can just write the elements that you want to instantiate right in front of it. That comes from C language. Essentially, if I want to, so so again, as I was mentioning, if I let's say um, uh, uh, if I want to say class. employee so I have character name and I have long employee ID okay now what I'm doing over here I'm, I'm gonna write you C, C code actually not C++ so I'm gonna make it a structure where did it come from it came from uh, C language so if I write over here struct employee, if it was C language and I wanted to instantiate this employee, what I had to do? I had to actually write struct, remember IPC? Struct employee E, is that correct? 
I had to do that. Then they say, okay, we are we going to add the capability so you can actually do it like this. So you can actually say E right over here. So it essentially becomes, so now you not only explain what an employee is, so you are instantiating it and you're making it an E, right? Even more so, if you do not want any other instance of it created, you can actually create an anonymous one. You can simply go that. So you're going to have an E. That E has a name and employee ID, and you can never create anything out of it anymore. It's only one instance. OK? So even you can do that. Now, what they did over here in C language, because in C we hated to actually keep writing struct employee, struct employee, struct employee. This is what we did. We actually wrote over here type def. Sorry, I don't know why my mouse has a mind of its own for some reason. OK, so we wrote type def. employee. That's C language, not C++. By doing this, I essentially make, said, give a new name to this type and call it employee. So it became a type. So I didn't really need to write struct employee something anymore. So if you look at old C programs, OK, nobody creates a structure. Everybody started a structure with a type def. Type def struct, wrote it, and then wrote the name down there. Like this, they didn't have to keep going struct, employee, struct. Because it's a type, now they could actually say employee E. Well, not get temporary buffer. Employee E, right? But in C++, now it is within the language. You create a structure, it becomes a type. You don't have to do this anymore, OK? So the fact that you can actually create a class structure or whatever and instantiate it right away after, like E comes from C language, which essentially is what you see. And again, remember that you can always use anonymous, you can always create anonymous stuff. For example, if I want to create an employee again, so I'll do class employee, and I want the employee to have a name. But I don't want to actually create a class name with first and last. Come on, give me a break. I just want to, you know, but I want to have them as a, a, a package. I can simply write in here, say, struct character first, character last. And right over here, name. Oh, let's call it M name for you to know that that's actually a member. So M name dot first will be first name. M name dot last will be last name. And that's part of it. It's just an anonymous structure. A structure that doesn't have a name, but it's a structure still. Are we OK with this? Are we OK one? Are we OK two? All right. Let's speed up. We talked about this. You know that. I talked about it. You know it. Construction. We talked about constructors in IPC 144. I'm not going to go through it again. This, is, this code that you see right now over here is exactly what you had in IPC 144 with an assignment operator and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, a copy constructor. Anytime you had classes with resources, you did this, right? You essentially created uh, a copy constructor. In that copy constructor, you reused your code by having the assignment operator, correct? Right? And then uh, in the assignment operator, you did what, whatever you wanted to do. Are we OK with this? OK? Because I don't have time to write the code, I'm going to use this one. Now, remember about moves that I was talking about? OK? Look at this one. Uh, 
Uh, let me just bring it to, to, the, to Visual Studio so I can hide pieces that are not relevant. I'm just going to bring it into, whoa, I don't want that. I, you can later on run that one and do it. Let me just hide this. I just want to hide all these. I don't want to teach. I don't want to see this. I don't want to see this. All right. Now, please take a look at this. This array of mine has resources in it, right? It's dynamically allocated, which means it's going to actually create a dynamic array or whatever. Now, take a look at this assignment operator. <clears throat> I'm saying if this, so I'm doing an assignment operator, so it actually be, is being assigned. Is that, do you see that? Okay. So what I'm doing over here is this. I'm saying delete my source. Okay. Then if I wanted to do copy assignment, I would have gone through, so I would delete that one, right? Then I would allocate a new one, then I would copy everything, and I would replace everything. Is that correct? That's what we did in copy constructors and assignment operators. Everybody appreciates that? Are we okay with that? I don't have to go through that code, hopefully. Do I? Now I'm going to implement the same thing, but take a look at this one. No loops. What the heck is happening in here? First, I'm deleting my resources. So the A that I have is gone. Then I'm going to say, get the address of the source and put it in here. Get the number of the source and put it in here. OK? Forget about dummy. That's for the thing. Set the source sources pointer to null. Set the size of the source to null and be done with it. This is what's happening here. OK? That's my object. Copying was done when you actually made another one and have copied everything, correct? Now, what it's doing is this. It says, if I want to move this one to here, if I want to move the source to destination instead of copying, I'm going to make my pointer, so this is A, this is A, my pointer to point to this one. I'm going to copy the 10 value to this one. Then I'm going to make this null. And I'm going to make this 0. What happened? I simply took over the ownership of the object I wanted to copy. Instead of copying the information, I took over its stuff and literally emptied whatever it had. And the only difference is that, look at my reference over here. It's an R value reference which means it will know when it's move time. And if it doesn't know, I'll make sure to remind them. So as you see, when copying is happening, copying is happening. It actually calls this operator, and it's going to call the regular copy constructor. But when a nameless object is coming, an object that is going to die soon, and I want to copy its values, why do I copy? It's going to die. I'm just going to assume its properties and nullify them so I don't have all that loop going on. Now that loop that you saw, just imagine if this array of mine has 50,000 elements. You know how quick it's going to be just to set the pointer to that one instead of allocating 50,000 things and copying 50,000 things? So what happens is now it actually says, if the object is about to die, if it's supposed to be moved, 
instead of assignment operator, call the move assignment operator. And because it says move source, the one where all value reference will be called. And therefore, everything is going to go perfectly set. That's when you need the move and a reference if you want to. And that's how you implement a move constructor or a copy constructor. So essentially, remember, when you are doing a move constructor, you are doing the bad thing that you used to not do in OP244. In OP244, we used to, by mistake, not to copy everything and just put an assignment and everything else would break loose. The only thing that I need to do now is to make the same mistake but tag it with an R value reference. So the compiler knows which one it has to call. And therefore, your program is going to speed up. And it's going to go much faster than usual. You're saving lots of time. Instead of copying, you're going to do moving. OK? So I'm going to do the exact same thing for that name and post it up for you. And that becomes moving. What's the time? Two minutes. I don't think I have time to do it now. But anyways, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply it to that name thingy that I have written, and I put the examples for it. Please open it up tonight and walk through it. OK? Step by step, walk through it and see what happens. See when it's being moved. See when it's not being moved. I'm going to create a defined statement up there and call it trace. So if the trace is on, it's going to print messages like moving, copying. You can turn off the trace so it works, or turn on the trace so it actually prints the messages for you so you know which one is being called. Please walk through it tonight and write a code of yourself. Get one of those dynamic memory allocation stuff you have done in OP244, add the move constructor and move assignment to it and see what happens, all right? Please do so. If you don't write code, you won't learn it. I guarantee that. Please, have a beautiful day.